For as long as I could remember, it was just me and my mom. My dad left when my mom was pregnant, and I could never forgive him for what he did to my mom. She had to raise me all on her own, and to make matters worse, she had a low-paying job and lived in a really bad part of town. Things were tough. My dad had abandoned me and my mom, and we were really poor. But then, something happened that changed everything, and my life was never the same after that. But before I go on, make sure that you like and subscribe, and hit that notification bell, and you will be rich when you're older. Trust me, it really works. My mom and I lived in a single-bedroom apartment with moldy walls and terrible living conditions. It was pretty bad. I remember going to bed on an empty stomach most nights, and for my mom, that was even more often since she preferred to give me food rather than eat herself. I went to a nearby school, but the kids were mean and the teachers didn't even care about the students. Plus, I had to wear old uniforms that previous students had left behind because my mom couldn't afford to buy me a new school uniform. Life was tough, to say the least. As I grew older, I never really had any hopes of getting a good job or making a lot of money. Because, like they say, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, right? But I was still going to try. When I graduated high school, I got a job at a restaurant as a waiter. They paid me next to nothing, and my boss treated me really badly. My colleagues were fine, but I really hated getting up for work each morning. Life was just so boring and so hard. But then came that fateful day, the day when my life changed forever. It was a Tuesday evening. I remember because on a Tuesday, we sell tacos at the restaurant, and I was picking up an order of tacos and handing them to the customers. Finally, my shift ended, and I walked home. The restaurant was only a five-minute walk from my home, so that wasn't too bad. On the way, I stopped at a convenience store. The cashier greeted me as I walked in. Hey there, Adam said the cashier. We knew each other since I had grown up in this apartment ever since I was a little kid. Hey, Tom, I replied. Got any chocolate nuts? Oh, sorry, we sold out of those. But listen, there's a lottery going on tonight. They're announcing the winners on TV. You should buy a lottery ticket. You never know, you might win. Oh, I don't know, Tom, I said. I don't really want to waste my money. I have little enough as it is. Adam, I have a feeling you're gonna be lucky tonight said Tom. Tell you what, you can have a lottery ticket on the house. Wow, thank you, Tom, I replied in surprise. Tom handed me a ticket and I went home. When I opened the door, my mom had also just gotten back from work. She had bags under her eyes and looked like she'd seen a ghost. I felt so angry that my mom had to work so hard just to pay bills. But maybe this lottery ticket would change things. Look, Mom, I got a lottery ticket, I said. Oh, that's nice, Adam, she said. But you shouldn't be wasting money on those things. We never win. No, but Tom bought it for me. Wow, that was very kind of him. All right, let's pop the television on and see if we win. We sat on the couch and switched to the right channel. They had just started, and before long, the winning numbers appeared on the screen. I looked down at my ticket, and my heart leapt up into my chest. We won. We won! I jumped to my feet and started dancing around the place. We won! We won! We won! My mom was so confused by my reaction, but once she read the numbers on the ticket and cross-referenced them to the ones on the TV, she started jumping for joy too. We won the lottery! We were gonna be millionaires! I literally couldn't believe my luck. This was almost too good to be true. I immediately called up the company and confirmed that I had the right numbers. The next day, I went to their office and signed a bunch of papers and took a ton of photos. And next thing I knew, a hundred million dollars had been transferred to my bank account. I wasn't just rich, I was super rich. Of course, I gave a lot of money to Tom the cashier. I gave him ten million dollars. He more than deserved it. He was the one who had given me the ticket for free. And I never would have gotten it if it weren't for him. Next, I gave some money to my friends at work. They worked so hard every day, and they definitely deserved the money. I didn't give it to my boss, though. He definitely didn't deserve it. And finally, of course, I bought my mom a nice house to live in. Not too big, but big enough, in a nice part of town where the neighbors were kind and friendly. I told mom to quit her job since we had enough money to live off for the rest of our life. And I also quit my job at the restaurant. 
Things were great. I was settling into the rich life quite nicely. We could eat whatever we wanted, buy whatever we wanted. It was great. Of course, I didn't forget about where I had come from, and I donated a ton of money to charities as well. For a while, things were fine. I had also gotten quite famous. People started to recognize my face as the one who won a hundred million dollars. Some old friends of mine would message me after years of no contact and ask for money. I knew they were just using me, but still, I felt bad and I gave them a bit. Nothing huge, just a bit to help them out. But then, something happened that threw my world upside down. My mom and I were at home. It was a Monday, but we had no work. No bosses to yell at us, no shifts to run. It was bliss. But then, suddenly, the doorbell rang. I wondered who it was. My mom went to open the door, and then I heard her scream. Panicking, I rushed to help her, but froze in my tracks. There was a man at the door. He was much older than me, probably about my mom's age, and there was something about him that was familiar. Mom looked like she really had seen a ghost. She was shaking all over. Hi, sweetie, said the man, and looked sadly at my mom. He then glanced over at me. Wow, you've grown, haven't you, son? Mom, who is this? I asked, though I feared I knew the answer. Mom took a deep breath. This is your dad. And then, well, things started to change a lot after that. Dad came in and we all sat in the living room. No one spoke. It was so awkward. But finally, after about 10 minutes of silence, Dad opened his mouth. Look, I know you'll probably never forgive me, but I've realized something, said Dad. I never should have left you two. I love you so much, but I felt like I wasn't good enough for you. I felt like you two were better off without me. That's why I left. I realize now that that was a mistake. I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I was very suspicious. Why come back now? Why didn't you come back 10 years ago? Dad nodded sadly. I was stuck abroad. I had no money to come back. I tried to contact you, but I guess my messages never went through. So it has nothing to do with the fact that I won the lottery, right? I asked skeptically. Adam, don't be rude, said mom in shock. Dad smiled at mom, and mom smiled nervously back, and that's when it hit me. Mom was falling in love with dad again. I had to put a stop to this. I was sure dad only came back for my money. Why else? It couldn't be a coincidence that he came back now. After that, we talked for a while, and mom asked me to give them some time alone. I was angry, so I left in a huff and got into my car and drove off. I needed time to think. By the time I came back, mom and dad were holding hands. Dad had sneaked his way back into our lives. And mom was too in love to realize it. I had to prove to her that dad was not an honest man. I had to make her realize that this was all an act. Dad ended up moving into the house with us. He tried to build a relationship with me, but I was not going to fall for his trick. I could see right through him. He was only here for my money. I decided I needed to make a trap. I needed to prove to mom that dad was not a good person and that we had to get him out of our lives once and for all. I called up Tom. I told him about my plan and he agreed. Everything was falling into place. The plan was ready and dad had no clue. The next day, I was sitting at the breakfast table with mom and dad when a van pulled up outside our house. I went to see who it was, but suddenly, a man wearing a black mask came in and told us he was kidnapping us. He grabbed me and tied my wrists and did the same for my mom and dad. We were all screaming in fear, calling for help, but no one heard us. We were forced into the back of the van. I was blindfolded, so I couldn't see where anything was. Finally, after about an hour's drive, we pulled to a stop and were taken to this warehouse. The blindfold was taken off me and I could only see Dad. My mom was nowhere in sight. Where's my mom? I demanded. The man with the black mask ignored me and he looked at my dad. I'm going to have you play a little game, all right? Dad nodded nervously. He looked terrified. <gasps> okay, continued the masked man. He pulled me in front of my dad. Then, to my right, he placed a briefcase and opened it to reveal a ton of money. You're going to choose. We have $50 million here. Or your son. What's it going to be? Are you insane? Yelled Dad. The masked man nodded. Maybe. So you'd better choose. You have 10 seconds starting now. Dad, 
please pick me, save me, I yelled. But dad didn't say anything. He glanced at me, then the money, then back to me, and he closed his eyes. I pick the $50 million, he said. I couldn't believe my ears. Did he really just say that? The masked man, or rather, Tom, took off his mask and looked at my dad with disgust. That's very disappointing. Then Tom pointed to the other guys and went into a room. I hadn't noticed it before, but there was a mirror there, and my mom had actually been hiding behind it, watching the whole thing. She came out of the secret room now and looked so angry with my dad. How dare you, she cried. Dad looked so confused. What's going on? But mom wasn't having it. She told him she never wanted to see his face ever again, and that they were over forever. I was glad to hear it. Tom untied me, and we left Dad there to get home by himself. The plan had worked perfectly. Tom was a really good fake kidnapper. Dad tried to come to us afterwards and apologize, but we called the police on him for harassing us, and he never came near us again. Mom and I are living happily together now, and things are going great. It makes me sad that my dad would pick money over me, but I guess it does show that you shouldn't trust everything you see. I have always been a bit of a loner. I was the girl that no one ever wanted to be friends with, and quite frankly, I didn't really care. I wasn't bothered about having lots of friends. I had something better than that. I had a secret crush. But before I go on, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. If you do, your crush will finally take you back. Trust me, it really works. When I was at school, I was always the girl sitting in the corner on her own eating her lunch. It had always been that way. I was used to it. I had one friend, Lucy, but she went to a different school. I wished that Lucy went to the same school as me. Then I would have someone to hang out with, to eat my lunch with, to chat about boys with. I wouldn't say I was miserable at school, but I definitely wasn't happy. Then one day, that all changed. A new boy joined our class. His name was Simon. He was tall and had big brown eyes. I thought he was the most good-looking boy I had ever seen. I didn't tell him that, of course. I was far too shy to do that. He was good at everything. He soon became a member of every school sports team. I had never been interested in sports, but now I made sure I watched every game. I just loved watching him running around the field. My days were much better now. I never actually plucked up the courage to speak to Simon. Until one day, I was sitting eating my lunch alone when Simon walked by. Hi, he said, smiling. I nearly choked on my lunch. Hi, I stammered as I coughed and tried to swallow my sandwich. He laughed in a nice way and carried on walking. I couldn't believe it. My heart was soaring. I walked home from school that afternoon and felt that life couldn't get any better. When I got home, Mom was just pulling in the drive. She had been to the gym. My mom was a gym freak. She literally went to the gym every day. She looked happy. I met a new friend at the gym today, she said. She has invited us over for dinner on Saturday night. Do I have to go? I asked. Yes, said Mom. You need to make some new friends. Mom had told me that her friend Diane had a son about my age. As they were new to the area, her son was keen to make new friends. I wasn't really looking forward to spending a Saturday night with my parents and their friends. But as I didn't have any other plans, I had no excuse to not go. Saturday came and we drove over to Mum's friend's house. Their house was just like ours, like all the houses in our town. Dad rang the doorbell. A nice-looking woman opened the door and invited us in. Hi, I'm Diane, she said to me. Why don't we go and sit down? We went through to the lounge. Would you like a drink? She asked. We are just waiting for my son to come downstairs, then we can have dinner. She made us all a drink and the grown-ups chatted away. I sat there sipping away at my lemonade. The door opened. I looked up and nearly spat out my drink. This is my son, Simon, said Mom's friend. I'm Amy, I said. I couldn't believe it. My crush was my mom's friend's son. Simon just looked over and smiled at me. He probably thought all I did was choke on food or drink. My hands were trembling as we sat down for dinner. I felt so nervous. But I didn't need to. Simon was soon chatting away to me. I felt like I had known him forever. He made me feel so relaxed. The evening flew by. I couldn't believe it when Dad said it was time to go home. I felt like I'd only been there for about 10 minutes. 
As my parents put on their coats, Simon leaned over to me and whispered, Would you like to hang out sometime? Was this really happening? My crush was asking me out on a date. Yes, that would be nice, I said, trying to act calm. Cool, I'll text you, said Simon. In the car on the way home, I couldn't stop smiling. Finally, my life was exactly how I wanted it to be. Simon texted me the following day. Let's go to the movies, he wrote. Sure, I replied. I met Simon outside the cinema. I could hardly concentrate on the movie. I kept looking over at Simon. He was engrossed in the film. If he did catch my eye, he would just smile. When the film finished, Simon walked me home. That was fun, he said. We should hang out again. From then on, we were always together. We would go to the park or sometimes get a pizza together. Even though he never actually made it official, I knew we were dating. I was sitting at home, dreaming about the perfect life I was going to have with Simon. I could imagine our little house. We would probably have two, if not three, children. And definitely a dog. My phone beeped, pulling me back to the present. It was a text message from Simon. Do you want to come over to my house tomorrow? I was surprised. Normally, we always met somewhere other than home. Surely this must mean something special. The next morning, I spent ages choosing what to wear. I wanted to look really nice when Simon asked me to be his girlfriend. I felt sure that's what was going to happen today. I couldn't eat any breakfast. My stomach was full of butterflies. You have to eat something, said Mom. I'll get something at Simon's house, I replied as I rushed out of the house. I arrived at Simon's house and we went up to his room. I sat down and he put on the TV. It was one of my favorite shows, but I could hardly concentrate on watching it. Simon looked a little nervous. I smiled to myself. He was obviously waiting for the perfect moment to ask me to be his girlfriend. Suddenly, Simon stood up. He walked over to his closet. As he was stepping inside, he said, Follow me. I have something to show you. I was a bit confused, but I followed Simon into the closet. At the back of the closet was a door. Simon opened the door and we stepped into a hidden room. I looked around me. What was going on? The walls were covered in photos. Photos of a girl. Not just any girl though. The photos were of my friend, Lucy. I looked over at Simon waiting for an explanation. He turned to me and said, I need your help. I know you are friends with this girl. I really like her. I have seen her in town and I think she is the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Can you help me to get a date with her please? I felt like my world had exploded and all of my dreams had been blown to pieces. This couldn't be happening. I wanted to cry, but instead I just said, Of course I will help you, that's what friends are for. How could I have been so stupid? Simon had just made friends with me to get closer to Lucy. Someone like him would never be interested in me. <gasps> Simon asked me if I could arrange a date for him and Lucy, so that's what I did. Well, at least I arranged it with Simon. I told him that Lucy had agreed to meet him at the bowling alley on Friday after school. I said that she would be there at 5 o'clock. The thing is, I didn't tell Lucy any of this. I wanted him to think that she was a mean girl. I went to the bowling alley at 5 o'clock and watched from across the street. Simon looked disappointed as the minutes ticked away and Lucy hadn't turned up. I waited a little longer and when he looked like he was about to leave, I went over to the entrance. Simon looked a little surprised to see me. She didn't come, he said, looking sad. To be honest, I'm not surprised, I replied. Lucy has done this before. I told him how she had stood up so many boys. That was a lie, but I needed Simon to see that we were perfect for each other. I said that I thought that Simon could get a much nicer girl than Lucy. I was meaning me, of course, but I didn't say that. I thought that would be the end of it, but no. Can you give me her Instagram? said Simon. I could hardly say no, could I? I gave him her Instagram name before making an excuse that I needed to go home. I knew what I would have to do. I ran home and up to my room. I quickly made an Instagram account in Lucy's name. Within minutes, I saw Simon was following my account. I started posting some really nasty things. I made jokes about people being bullied. I just wanted Simon to think Lucy wasn't a nice girl. I sent him a message saying, Amy said you wanted to message me. He replied straight away telling me that he had seen me in town and thought I was so cute. He said that my hair was lovely. Oh, I know, I wrote back. My hair is better than anyone else's. I just wanted him to think that Lucy was overconfident. In all the messages I wrote to him, I made sure that Lucy sounded mean. I wrote that she was so popular, 
that all the boys thought she was so pretty, I was sure that Simon would be put off Lucy, but it didn't work. You seem so different from the way you look, wrote Simon. I'm going to call you. I didn't know what to do. I had given Simon Lucy's telephone number, but it was my number. With that, my telephone rang. Simon could see that the number he was ringing was actually to Amy and not Lucy. I answered the phone. Amy, how could you do this to me? shouted Simon. I thought you were my friend. Simon cut off the phone. I started sobbing. My plan had totally backfired. I tried to call Simon back, but he wouldn't pick up the phone. I wanted to tell him that the only reason I did it was because I was in love with him, but I never got the chance. The next morning when I woke up for a split second, I forgot what had happened. Then it all came rushing back to me. My heart sank. I was dreading going to school. As I walked through the school gates, I could see everyone staring at me. How could you be so mean? said one of the girls as she walked past me. She was meant to be your friend, said another. Everyone knew. I spent all day trying to hide myself away. The only thing I could hope for was that Lucy wouldn't find out. She went to a different school, so maybe she wouldn't hear about it. She was the only friend I had. After school, I went straight over to Lucy's house. As I walked up the path to her house, I saw her looking out of her window at me. She wasn't smiling. I knocked on the door, and her mom opened it. Amy's here, she shouted up to Lucy. Go straight up, Amy. I went up the stairs to Lucy's bedroom. I opened the door, and as I looked at Lucy, I knew that she had found out what I had done. She looked at me angrily. How could you do that to me? She asked. I'm sorry, I said. It's too late, she replied. Get out of my house. I never want to see you again. I'm sad to say this, but Lucy and I were never friends again. Simon and Lucy started dating. I would sometimes see them walking hand in hand through town. If they saw me, they would cross the street. They didn't want anything to do with me after everything I had done. Because of my stupid mistake, I had lost not only my crush, but my only friend, too. Do you ever feel like you can't trust the people you live with, but you just don't know why? I lived with my mom and my older sister, Jenny. I was 14 years old, and I had never met my dad. My mom always told me that he died in a freak accident when I was a baby. Whenever I asked her to explain, she told me that the details were too horrific to describe. Although we lived in a single-parent household, we had a lot of money. Our home was huge, and I was allowed to buy anything I wanted. I didn't have an allowance, really. I could just go to my mom's purse and take whatever I wanted, including her credit cards. I had no idea where our wealth came from, and I never questioned it. My mom didn't work, and she spent most of her days bossing the servants around and lounging by the pool. Before I continue the weird story of my life, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. You don't want to miss out on any amazing content. Anyway, where was I? I grew up spoiled, but I wasn't condescending like the rich kids you may have seen in the movies. I had ordinary friends who weren't as rich as I was, and I'd give them whatever they asked for. Everything was fine and life was a breeze until that afternoon I returned home from school early one day. I saw a plump, red-haired woman dressed in a tight purple dress standing at my front door. She smelled like alcohol, and as I came closer, I noticed that her eyeshadow was smudged all over her face. I wanted to laugh. <laughs> oh, thank God you're here, dear. I've been waiting all afternoon to see you. Your rotten mother won't open the door. She told the servants to ask me to go away, she said. Who are you? I asked, baffled. Oh, Leah, darling, I'm your Aunt Brenda, your father's sister. Your mother doesn't like me, that's why we never met. But I'm tired of her stupid rules. She's an awful, awful woman, she said while hiccuping. She was clearly drunk. Could you please not speak so rudely about my mother, I said angrily. At that moment, I saw my mother's face appear by the front window. Leah, get inside this instant. Brenda, get off my property or I will call the police, she screamed. Here, take this, keep it safe, my drunk aunt said while slipping a post-it note into my hand. I put it in my pocket while my mom continued her noise. Leah, I said get inside, my mom screamed. I opened the door and locked it quickly behind me. Mom, I didn't know I had an aunt. How come you never told me about her before, I asked. She's crazy and she's not important. Your father's family never liked me. I hate all of them. Stop asking so many questions. Go to your room, my mom shouted. I'd never seen her that angry before, so I ran to my room and stayed there until it was dark. After dinner, I remembered the note from my aunt. I dug it into my pocket and took it out. Only a number was written on it, and for a while I was confused. Hmm, maybe it's a telephone number, I thought. I got my phone and dialed it right away. Hello? A male voice said on the other end. Hi, my aunt gave me this number. Who are you? I asked. 
Oh my god, is this Leah? He asked. Yes, how do you know who I am? I replied. It's me, Leah. Dad, I'm your father, he said. Is this some kind of joke? My father is dead, I said. Is that what your mother told you? Anyway, I don't know why I'm surprised. What I'm about to say to you is very important and I need you to take me very seriously. It's for your own safety. I begged your Aunt Brenda to pass on the message, but I guess she was too drunk. Your life is in danger. Your mother isn't who you think she is. She is a very dangerous criminal. We were married for a few years, and when I found out who she really was, you were only a baby. I had to leave because she knew that I had found out the truth. I found out that she hired hitmen to kill me, so I had to go into hiding. I'm sorry I have not been in your life, but it's not my fault and I promise that it will all change someday. I know you may not believe me, and that's why I've put all the proof in a safety deposit box. I don't know how, but you need to save yourself from her, he said frantically. He told me he left the key to the safety deposit box in a little hardware store owned by his friend in town. He said that his friend would also give me directions to the private bank where the deposit box was located. After we hung up, I was bewildered. I wanted to believe that it was all a joke, but the next day, I went to look for the key anyway. The store wasn't hard to find. I met the owner, and he quickly recognized me. Good luck. Here are the directions to the bank. He said as he placed the key and a piece of paper in my hands. I hopped into a taxi right away and gave the driver the directions I just got. I was there in about 30 minutes. I walked in, showed them my key, and they led me to the box. When I opened it, there was a pile of documents all arranged in neat folders. I carefully picked them up and placed them in my backpack. I got home in a flash and ran up to my room to read them. My mom was lounging in the pool as usual, and I'm not sure where my sister was. I locked my door and began reading. Two hours later, I felt like my life had spiraled completely out of control. There was evidence that my mother had been involved in money laundering, selling and trafficking drugs, and worst of all, murder. There were several newspaper clippings which reported a story about six men who were set on fire and killed in a drug deal gone wrong. It mentioned that my mother was the prime suspect. That was not even the worst crime. Some are too gruesome for me to even mention on this channel. I wondered why my mother wasn't in prison and came to the conclusion that the network of criminals was so great that even the police were afraid to do anything to them. I felt dizzy and sick to my stomach. First, I find out my father is alive and now my mom is a dangerous criminal, I thought. Suddenly all our riches made sense. I had to pretend like I knew nothing, so I went downstairs and had a normal conversation with my mother. It was the beginning of summer and we were planning a trip to the Caribbean on our yacht. She was excited about the details and told me about all the plans she had for each island we'd be stopping on. After a week, we were all packed and breathing the fresh scent of the ocean. My bedroom on the yacht was my favorite. I liked it even more than the one in the house. It was spacious and cozy. It had huge windows and I could see the sea as we sailed. I sighed as I realized this would be my last trip with my family. I had made an escape plan which I'd need to execute as soon as possible. The first few days were amazing. Or at least I pretended like they were. Soon I would put my plan into effect. I had already bought hair dye and a few other things to change the way I looked. Of course, I also took a few thousand dollars from my mom's safe at home. I had stuffed these things in my backpack before we left the house. When we reached the Grenadines, I decided that I had to act quickly. I waited until everyone was asleep one night. Then I packed up my backpack, tied it in a garbage bag so it wouldn't get wet, then quietly jumped into the sea. I swam until I reached the shore. When I did, I changed my clothes and left the wet ones on the shore. I walked until I found a safe spot to rest for the night. In the morning, I asked for directions to a ferry terminal. I took a ferry to the mainland, St. Vincent, then took a plane to Barbados. It was a very short flight and for a moment, I felt free. When I reached Barbados, I looked around at all the faces and felt scared and lost. This was it. I was really alone now. I went to the bathroom and put on a blonde wig. I also wore a huge pair of glasses. I did everything I could to not look like myself. Now what? I thought. I walked up to a random couple. Can you please help me? My parents just left me here and I have nowhere to go. I lied while trying to look as sad as I could. Oh no, poor child. Come with us, the man said. They took me to their car and drove me to a home for children who had been abused or abandoned. I'm sorry we couldn't take you home with us. We think you will be safer here he said while his wife smiled sadly at me. He spoke to a tall woman who seemed to be in charge of the place. She motioned to me to come over. I know it all seems weird, but in a few days, I went from enjoying my life on a yacht as a typical rich kid to sharing a room with 10 other kids in an orphanage. I lived there for about two weeks. 
It wasn't as horrible as you might imagine an orphanage to be. The other kids were nice to me, especially because I looked different. Because it was summer, I didn't have to get enrolled in a school or anything, so most of my days consisted of doing chores and playing games. One day, the tall woman, who later introduced herself as Miss Jameson, called me into her office. There was a man and a woman sitting inside. Harriet, she said. I had told them my name was Harriet because I obviously couldn't use my real name. We have some good news for you. There is a couple who would like to adopt you, she continued. That's wonderful, I replied, not knowing what else to say. We are Mr. and Mrs. Beaton. We are farmers and we live in a lovely little house by the sea. We would love to adopt you. We've been trying to have children for years, but we've had no luck, Mr. Beaton said. So I became the adopted daughter of two farmers who seemed so happy to have me as their daughter. I learned how to take care of the animals on the farm. Every day I had to milk the cows and check on the chickens to see if they had laid eggs. Once I had finished all my work, I was allowed to chill out on the beach for the rest of the day. What a simple life! I was in the middle of tying the goats one afternoon when a little girl in a green frilly dress approached me. Are you Harriet? She asked. Yes, and who are you? I asked. I'm not telling you. Look! She said as she handed me a piece of paper. I took it and she sped off. I looked and saw another telephone number. Oh, not again, I thought as I rushed back to the house. I dialed the number. Leah! It was my dad. What's going on? How do you know where I am? I asked. Listen carefully. I'm very proud of you for making it this far, but the people who adopted you aren't safe. They knew who you were all along. Why do you think your mama hasn't made your disappearance public? You've practically disappeared and not even the police know. Mr. and Mrs. Beaton are part of the same criminal network as your mother, and you need to get away from them, he said. But Dad, why do you keep sending notes instead of coming for me yourself? Why don't you come to take me somewhere safe? I asked, but it was too late. He had already hung up. I ran away from that house the same night, and I'm still on the run. Sometimes I think I should go back to my mom and hope she will forgive me. Nothing is the same, and I don't enjoy this type of life. What would you do if you were me? Do you know the kind of movies where the babysitter is a psycho? Those movies had traumatized me since I was a kid. And because of that, I had no interest in having a babysitter whatsoever. But no matter how much I resisted, my parents got me one. They were busy, hardworking business people and had to stay out of the house most of the time. So I had no choice but to get a sitter, even when I was 14. But before we move on, like this video and hit that subscribe button and activate the notification bell. And you'll never have bad luck in life. Trust me, it works. I did throw one or two tantrums about that, but that didn't exactly work with my parents. But I guess maybe out of luck or something, my babysitter turned out to be really nice. She didn't talk much and was about my mother's age and didn't look creepy like the ones in the movies, so she was fine. At least that was what it seemed at first. She was my babysitter as well as our housekeeper. She cleaned all the rooms, made all my favorite food, and not just that, she even drove me to and from school. We got such a good deal with her. Who even works this much for so little money? My mom said one day while we were having dinner, and my dad nodded his head in agreement. I was also happy about that because I didn't have to do any housework, which I had to do otherwise for pocket money. Life was going good like that, but slowly I realized that the babysitter was starting to take more and more control over my life. For example, when she came to pick me up from school, she would start honking like crazy if I got out even a minute later. That was so embarrassing. I had to run to get to the car as soon as the classes were done and couldn't stay back and chat with my friends. Also, I had to finish up all the food she made for me and couldn't even leave one grain behind. And being full was not an excuse she would take. I was like a puppet whose thread was in her hands. Because of all that, I was fed up with her and wanted to get rid of her. However, my parents were not up for it. It was as if she had put some kind of spell on them. They were really pleased with her and her work, and there was also the part about having to pay her less. Of course, they had no idea about how she was controlling my life and making it a living hell. One day, I was just passing by my parents' room to get to mine when I saw that the door there was cracked open. But my parents weren't home at the time, so I decided to take a peek in, and what I saw there was bizarre and confusing. My babysitter was in my parents' room, dressed in my mom's clothes and jewelry. Well, that's odd, I thought, all confused about what she was doing. That led me towards one clear explanation. She was stealing from my mom. At that moment, instead of confronting her, I made up my mind that I was going to tell my parents all about it. 
expose her, and finally get rid of her. As soon as my parents came home that day, I went to them, running to tell them everything. Mom, she's a thief. The babysitter is a thief. I told them without taking a moment to breathe. What are you talking about? Mom replied, all worried. I saw her in your room. She was taking your jewelry, I said, and added that she should go and check what items in her room are missing. After hearing all I had to say, my parents called the babysitter to come out of the kitchen, and then all of us made our way to the room. There, my mom checked each and every drawer and closet, one by one, properly. I don't understand, Eddie. All my valuables are right where I left them. Nothing's missing, mom said. And as soon as she said that, the babysitter burst out crying and fell on her feet. What a drama queen, I thought. But she started blabbering out her side of the story, which was absolutely untrue. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Zyper. I was just doing my job in cleaning your room. I don't know why the boy thinks I'm a thief, she said, crying out even louder now. And she was successful in fooling my parents with her crocodile tears. My parents instantly started apologizing to her as if their life depended on it. We are so sorry, Maria. We didn't mean to hurt you. Eddie here just needs to learn a lesson. Dad said and told me I was grounded for a month and they were also taking away my pocket money for a week. You might easily guess what happened after that. She had more power over my parents that led to her influencing all their decisions that concerned me. I was honestly living like a prisoner in my own house. I had to follow strict bad and TV time rules. I had to eat whatever she made and could barely go out to play with my friends. Life was not so good, but after some time, I got really, really bored because of having to stay at home all the time. That's it. If she's not letting me out, I'll call my friends over, I said to myself and texted my group to come for a sleepover because my parents were out that day. Three of my friends came over instantly and there was a lot of chattering, shouting, and laughing in the house. We played video games and ate a lot of junk food. I hadn't had this good of a time in so long. However, I could tell that Maria was not happy about it by the look on her face. After playing video games till midnight, we finally went to bed. I went to my room while my friends slept in the guest room. But something strange happened in the morning because when I woke up, my friends were not there anymore. Did they leave without telling me? I thought, but figured that their parents might have come to pick them up, so I didn't think much about it. Then, at school, I went to find my friends first thing, but all of them were ignoring me. I just kept on thinking about what went wrong, but couldn't figure out why. And to be honest, I was just done wondering. So at lunchtime, I went up to them in the cafeteria and demanded to know what was going on and why they were acting so cold towards me. One of my friends then took a long breath and started speaking. Your babysitter is what happened. She scared the life out of us last night, man, he said and told me that she warned them to never show up in the house ever again or talk to me. Otherwise, she would show their parents some pictures of my friends sneaking out of school, which could get them in trouble. She's a psycho. I think you should watch your back and beware of her, he added. And that was it. I didn't even have friends anymore. After that, my life became very depressing and boring. And at times, I even felt like running away from the house. But let's be real, there was nowhere I could go. However, after what seemed like forever, I finally turned 16. And that was when my parents gave me the best news of my life. Since you're old enough to take care of yourself now, we're getting rid of Maria, my mom said. Finally, I thought, and assured my parents that their decision was perfect. Then, the good times began for me. I could finally breathe the air of freedom. I could go wherever I liked, whenever I liked, and hang out with my friends as much as I wanted. They even started coming to my house for sleepovers again after I told them that the babysitter was out of the picture. And the best part was that I finally confessed my feelings to a girl I liked and got a girlfriend. Everything was going smoothly after that. Sometimes I would take my girlfriend out on dates. Sometimes I would hang out with my friends. But at times, I felt as if someone was watching me or following me. I know you might think I was being paranoid, but one time, even while I was on a vacation with my parents on a far off island, I felt the same eyes watching over me. I was chilling on the beach and relaxing in the sun when I felt like I saw the psycho babysitter. Did she follow me here? I thought, but I brushed that feeling off quickly as I wanted to heal from the trauma she put me through and also because I just saw her once, so I must have been mistaken. Slowly, I was able to erase her and the difficult times from my mind but I had no idea what was waiting for me because a year after that, 
my worst nightmare came back. My parents and I were getting ready for the weekend brunch when suddenly the crazy babysitter came crying at our door. Mr. and Mrs. Zyper, I haven't found any job since I left here. I'm so poor. Please, give me a job. She begged and cried. Since my parents were very kind and soft-hearted people, they agreed to keep her as a housekeeper without even asking for my opinion. However, this time, I decided that I will not let her have control over my life. I decided to put on my imaginary iron suit and be brave like an iron man. I am not letting her win this time, I said to myself and accepted my parents' decision. After that, just to show her that I was not her puppet anymore, I started going out more often. I would even bring my girlfriend over for a movie night or a video game. But then, something weird happened. I know, I should have expected that with the psycho babysitter around. The thing was, I was getting lazier. To be precise, sleepy whenever I had plans to go out. I had to find out what was going on, so I secretly installed some nanny cams on multiple parts of the house. And what the camera recorded was unbelievable and unacceptable. The video from the kitchen revealed that the crazy woman was mixing some kind of pill in my dinner. Most probably a sleeping pill. That was the reason why I was feeling sleepy all the time. It was not some little thing I could ignore and let go of. I had to show everything to my parents and then the police. For that, I called my parents who were at work at that time to let them know about the situation. But strangely, none of their phones were reachable. So, without wasting any time, I drove to my parents' office, and when I reached there, I got the shock of my life. My parents' colleagues informed me that they had not been to the office for five days. We have been trying to reach them, but their phones are not reachable, one of them said. I thanked them and got out of there, thinking I should wait for my parents at home. However, even after days of waiting, my parents didn't show up, but I thought maybe they went on a vacation without telling me. While all the bizarre things were happening in my life, my girlfriend also ghosted me and blocked me from calling or texting her. Sketchy, right? I had the same thought like you. It must be a maniac in my life. I was so done sitting back and letting her ruin my life like that. Hence, I decided to do some stalking of my own on her before going to the police. I picked a time when Maria was working in the kitchen. I sneaked out of the house secretly to pay a visit to the location she had provided to my parents as her home. It was an old and shabby place, and looking from the outside, it didn't seem like anyone would even live there except for ghosts. Because it was old, it was easier for me to enter the place. As soon as I got in, I was shocked because the walls of the house were filled with my pictures from when I was a baby to my first day of school to whatnot. I was creeped out and wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, but I had to see the rest of the house. Slowly, I went around the house like a rat, not making even a single sound and there was nothing to see there. Really just a couple of pieces of old furniture and an old computer in the corner, which stood out to me. I opened the computer and what I found out shocked me even more. It was the haunting search history on that computer. The search history showed that the psycho woman had looked up all my social media and government information multiple times on the internet. Also, the search history went back to years, which meant she had searched for me before even coming to my house as a babysitter. What does she have in mind for me? I thought, all scared and nervous. Right then, I was startled by the noise made by the squeaky old door. Oh no, someone's coming in, I said to myself, but it was too late for me to run. I was so scared and my poor heart almost gave up when I saw the psycho babysitter enter. It was like all those horror movies all over. But I knew what I had to do. For that, I put up a brave face and of course, the imaginary iron suit what is all this, you creep? Explain yourself, I asked. Don't use that language with your birth mother, she shouted and told me that I was her son. She also told me that she had put me up for adoption because she was poor, but then she couldn't stay away from me afterward. There's no point in hiding the truth now. I did everything out of love, she added, but I didn't believe her for a second. You're a liar and I'm going straight to the police from here, I said and started to walk out of there before she stopped me. You wouldn't want to do that if you love your parents, she said and showed me a video on her phone. My heart sank like the Titanic when I saw that she had my parents locked up in a cage. I couldn't utter a word while the psycho woman laughed like crazy. She warned me that if I went to the police, she would harm my parents and then lock me up in my house. What should I do? I am locked in my house guarded by the psycho babysitter. Should I take the risk of calling the police? 
let me know your suggestion in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and check out other videos on the channel. The school bell rang and I picked up my things to go to class. I was walking by with a group of friends and that's when I spotted her. Stacy, possibly the hottest girl at school and definitely the most popular. Every boy basically had a crush on Stacy, including me. I froze on the spot, my mouth hanging open as Stacy walked past. With her blonde hair and blue eyes, she looked just like a Barbie doll. My friend nudged me in the side. Go talk to her, he said. But before I go on, make sure you like this story and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any more crazy stories. If you do, your crush will finally like you back. Trust me, it really works. I gulped and I stepped forward. Um, hi, Stacy. How's your day? I asked nervously. Stacy smiled. It's great, Max. Thank you. How's yours? I it's fine, I stuttered. Stacy and I had been friends since we were babies. You see, our parents were close friends, and Stacy and I had always hung out with each other at playdates for as long as I could remember. I had also had a crush on Stacy for as long as I could remember, but I always had the feeling Stacy never felt the same way. My heart ached because I knew that I loved her, but she didn't love me back. For years, things continued like normal. I never told Stacy about my love, and she never seemed to notice. My friends knew, but I had forced them to swear to never tell Stacy. But then something happened, something that changed my life forever. I was walking home from school by myself. It was quite dark and I was late because I had to stay behind in math class. My grades were decreasing and my teacher told me I needed to pick things up, otherwise he'd have to tell my parents. Anyway, I was walking down the street when I spotted Stacy. She was with a group of her friends and they were crossing the road. I watched them cross, but suddenly, a car zoomed around the corner. It was heading straight for them, and I wondered if the driver maybe couldn't see them because it was so dark. I thought Stacy and her friends would notice, but they didn't even see the car coming because they were chatting amongst themselves. I don't know what got into me, but all of a sudden, I started bolting towards Stacy. The car was heading straight for us, and I was pretty sure it was gonna crash into us. But at the last second, I managed to grab Stacy and pull her aside. The car zoomed by, and I literally saw my life flash before my eyes. I think I might have blacked out, but when I regained consciousness, I saw that Stacy was staring at me strangely. Max, you saved my life, she said in shock. I nodded slowly. Um, I guess I did. Stacy, you should be more careful. Stacy paused, and suddenly she leaned forward and kissed me on the lips. I couldn't believe what was happening. Stacy's friends also couldn't seem to believe that Stacy would kiss me of all people. Stacy pulled away. Max, I owe you my life. Thank you. Uh, um, no problem, I replied. And, well, ever since that incident, Stacy and I just sort of started dating. It was weird. I never expected Stacy to like me, but... After that, she was all lovey-dovey around me, and we became a couple. I wasn't going to complain, though. This was what I had been dreaming of my whole life. In fact, on numerous occasions, I would pinch myself just to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I treated Stacy like a queen. I did everything, she said. If she told me to punch someone, I probably would. If she told me to jump off a cliff, I probably would. Life was perfect. Although, sometimes there were strange moments where I felt like Stacy was annoyed by me. Like when I would hug her and whisper, I love you. She would just hug me coldly back and say nothing. When I told my friends about that, they would say, maybe she's only dating you because you saved her life. I would shout at them when they said that and just storm off. I didn't want to believe it, but a small voice in my head made me worry that it was true. And then Stacy started to act really weird. She would disappear sometimes and never answer her phone. I was really starting to get worried now. What if Stacy was cheating on me? Practically every guy had a crush on Stacy, so it's not like it would be hard for Stacy to find someone to cheat with. I was getting paranoid. I didn't want Stacy out of my sight. I admit sometimes I got a little clingy, but it was only because I thought she was cheating and I didn't want to lose Stacy after I finally managed to get her to date me. And that's when I found the answer. I was scrolling online when an ad played for this new innovative device. It was a GPS tracker, one that you could plant in a phone. I thought this was the perfect solution. 
I would sneak this into Stacy's phone without her looking. That way, I would know whether she was cheating or not. I ordered the GPS tracker. It was quite expensive, but I thought it was worth it. And the next day, when Stacy and I were hanging out, I planted it into her phone when she wasn't looking. Now, there's another thing that I should tell you that is probably important. Stacy has an identical twin. I had never met Stacy's twin. Her name is Sally because she lived in France while Stacy lived in the US. Stacy and Sally's parents were divorced, so they agreed to take one twin each when they moved apart. It's kind of like the Parent Trap movie, except Stacy and Sally both knew about each other from the start. Now, Stacy's twin sister was coming to visit us in the US. We met her at the airport and it was so much fun. I really liked Sally. She was funny and pretty, of course, because she looked exactly like Stacy. And she was also really sweet. We got along really well. Then came the time for Sally to leave. I was going to miss her, and I hugged her as she left to board her plane back to France. Stacy and I drove back home, and Stacy was crying a bit because she obviously was going to miss her sister. For a few weeks after that, things were better off between us than they had ever been. Something changed in Stacy. She was much more affectionate, and she even said, I love you to me. That was the first time she had ever said that. She seemed to be a lot kinder, too. I usually made her breakfast in bed every Sunday, and this time she actually said thank you. I was not used to this kindness. Usually, Stacy just grunted and ignored me while she ate her breakfast. I was really liking this new Stacy. I had almost forgotten about that GPS tracker that I had put in her phone. But then one day, I got a notification about it. I looked on my phone screen, and it said there was an update on Stacy's phone's location. I clicked on the app and opened it up, but what I saw shocked me to my core. According to this app, Stacy was in France. But what was she doing there? That didn't make any sense. Surely Stacy hadn't left all of a sudden without telling me. I was starting to panic. Was Stacy cheating on me? Why would she leave me without saying goodbye? I thought I had no choice, so I drove straight to the airport and booked the next available flight to Stacy's location. I arrived and ordered a taxi to Stacy's location. We arrived at a huge house. I rang the doorbell and the servant let me in. I walked into the back and I was surprised to find Stacy lounging out by the pool. She was wearing sunglasses and a spring dress and didn't even have a care in the world. Stacy, I cried, what are you doing here? Stacy jumped in shock. She looked at me like I was a ghost. What are you doing here? She asked in surprise. I, I, I stopped talking. This was the hard part. I had to tell Stacy the truth. Um, you see, I began, I actually sort of put a GPS tracker on your phone. What? Yelled Stacy. She looked at me angrily. She looked a lot more like the Stacy I was used to. Yeah, I just, I thought you were cheating on me and I wanted to make sure, Max, you can't do things like that. I know, I'm so sorry, but why are you in France? Why didn't you tell me you left? This time, Stacy looked a little guilty. Oh, um, I'm visiting my sister Sally. But why didn't you tell me? I literally saw you yesterday. You should have said something. We could have come over together. Oh, right, yeah, I should have told you. I'm sorry. Are we even now? She said. I was a little stunned, but I nodded. Of course. I stepped forward and hugged her, kissing her on her forehead. Now, I'm not sure whether I imagined this part or not, but I'm pretty sure she cringed when I kissed her. Anyway, after that, I wanted to see Sally, but Stacy said it was too late and we had to go home straight away. I was really confused by this part, but I just listened to Stacy and did what she said. We went to the airport, but at the last minute, Stacy said she had booked separate flights due to some sort of discount deal. And by the time I arrived back home, Stacy was already there. Now, I was starting to get a little suspicious. Something was wrong. Stacy, what's going on? I asked. Stacy was sitting in her bedroom on her phone. What are you talking about? You've been acting a little strange lately, I said. I don't know what you're talking about, she replied. I was starting to suspect something was going on between Sally and Stacy. What if, what if the person in front of me wasn't Stacy at all? What if she was actually Sally? Everything would make sense then. The different behavior, Stacy's location in France. And then I had an idea. I'm going to call your phone, I said. I dialed Stacy's number. What? Stacy slash Sally looked alarmed. Why? No reason, I said. I called and the phone rang. Then, miraculously, Stacy answered the phone. 
Except the person in front of me, lying on her bed, never said anything. Hello? She said. Is this Stacy? I asked on the phone. Yes, who is this? I didn't reply. I just hung up. That had just confirmed my worst fears. Stacy and Sally had swapped places. Sally, I know it's you, I said to the twin in front of me. What? I'm not Sally, I'm Stacy. She tried to lie, but I knew the truth already. Please, Sally, just tell me the truth, I said. <sighs> Sally sighed, and then she nodded her head. Fine, she said. And that's when she told me the heartbreaking truth. Stacy had gotten bored of me. She had been attracted to me when I had saved her from that car, but then the attraction had disappeared. She didn't like me, not one bit, but she didn't want to make the effort of breaking up with me. So she asked her sister, Sally, for a favor, to replace her, to pretend to be her. So when Sally had come to visit that time, it wasn't Sally that had left back for France. It had been Stacy. Sally told me that Stacy had wanted a break from me. That's why she had gone to France. Look, if you're thinking this sounds confusing, imagine how I felt. But Max, I really like you, said Sally. She grabbed my hand. I, I'm sorry for tricking you. I don't understand why my twin sister doesn't like you. You're so sweet and funny and handsome. Please forgive me. I was hesitant, but I had to admit, I loved Sally. I never realized it, but I actually loved Sally much more than Stacy. Sally was such a kind-hearted soul. Of course I forgive you. I love you, Sally, I said. And then we both started crying. We hugged and things were fine between us again. But I told her that I wanted to do something first, to get back at Stacy for tricking me. I wanted to get revenge. And that's exactly what I did. A week later, the real Stacy, pretending to be Sally, returned from France. She arrived home. Stacy, Max, she called. Hi, I'm here on a visit again. Hi, Sally, I said, welcoming her home. Sally had told me the day before that Stacy asked her to swap places and clothes once they got into the bathroom. Then, sure enough, Stacy asked Sally to come into the bathroom, and that's when they swapped clothes. Out come the real Stacy and Sally. Phew, that flight was long, said Sally, winking at me. Stacy stepped toward me and kissed my cheek. I hope it wasn't too bumpy, Stacy said to Sally. And then I did something really unexpected. I stepped toward Sally and kissed her full on the mouth. Stacy screamed in shock. What are you doing, Max? She cried. I told Stacy that I knew all about her tricks. I told her I was actually in love with Sally and that Sally and I were dating now. Stacy was speechless. Sally and I are still dating now. I'm still friends with Stacy, but she always gets a little embarrassed when we're around. I ended up moving to France with Sally, and life has never been better. His hazel brown eyes locked with mine and he flashed a smile. My heart fluttered as he nodded at me when he passed. For the first time in my life, I was speechless. My friends giggled next to me and judged me lightly, teasing me and they whispered, Malik and Jamie sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. But before I continue, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and click that notification bell. If you do, you'll get seven days of good luck. So back to my story. Malik Johnson came to Charleston about two weeks ago with his mom and dad. The way he strolled through the hallway with confidence, you wouldn't believe that he was the new kid on the block. We had one class together, maths, and that was my worst class ever. Every time the teacher called me to answer a question, I would just sit there with a blank expression on my face. Malik probably thought that I was such an airhead. My friend Sophia would tease me and say, well, we know who the bright one in the family would be. On Saturdays, I volunteered at the animal shelter. While while attending to Pixie, a playful golden retriever. Sally, the animal shelter supervisor, walked up to me with none other than Malik at her side. Hi, Jamie. We have a new volunteer today. I was hoping that our best volunteer could show him the ropes. Hi, Jamie, Malik said, giving me a little wave. Oh, the two of you know each other. This makes it even better. Malik, I now leave you in the capable hands of Jamie. With that, she turned on her heels and left us. I cleared my throat and focused my attention once more on Pixie. Hi, Malik. What brought you to this neck of the woods? Well, he said, leaning forward to Pat Pixie, who licked his hand playfully. He continued, I always wanted a dog, but my mom was allergic, and this is the closest thing that I can do to get one. He sighed heavily. I know that feeling all too well. I said, looking up at him. My dad's allergic, so the only pet that I have at home is a goldfish named Spike. He looked at me with a raised eyebrow, and a smile spread across his lips. 
Spike? That afternoon was one of the best afternoons of my life. We had so many things in common, like rock bands, places we visited, subjects at school that we don't like. I showed him how to clean the kennels, give the dogs their medication, and then we took the dogs for a walk. After saying goodbye to Sally, Malik offered to walk me home. When he got to my house, he gave me a slip of paper. What's this? I asked as I opened it. It's my number. Maybe you could give me a call sometime. He waved goodbye and I floated to my room on cloud nine. The next night, I got a frantic phone call from Sally. Jamie, two of the dogs are missing. What? Which two? I said as I flew up from watching the TV. Hercules and Pixie. I froze. Hercules was a Saint Bernard. He and Pixie came to the shelter around the same time. I'm heading out to look for them. I'll let you know if anything comes up. I explained to my mother what the situation was. I don't think it's a good idea for you to head out alone. Do you have anyone you could go with? I'll call Malik. I told my mom, surprised with myself. He's another volunteer at the shelter. I ran to my room to change my clothes and to call Malik. I called the number, but a female voice answered the phone. Hi, my name is Jamie. May I speak with Malik, please? The female voice hesitated. Hi, this is Mrs. Johnson. Malik isn't home right now. He went to meet his dad after work. I will let him know that you called. With that, the phone line went dead. I left my bedroom and made my way to the front door. Mom, I'm leaving, I shouted. Her head peeked from the kitchen. Did you get on to Malik? Yes, he will be meeting me at the shelter, so we can look for the dogs. I lied. Okay, keep me informed. I hope you find them. I nodded and left home. I sort of felt bad for lying at my mom, but I knew she wouldn't let me go alone. After searching for about an hour for the dogs, I ended up in the park. It was deserted at this time of night, since it wasn't well lit. I knew it was risky going to the park alone, but if it meant finding Hercules and Pixie, then I was willing to take the risk. Hercules? Pixie? I whispered loudly as I walked through the park. I heard rustling behind me. I stopped and turned. Hercules? Pixie? Nothing. I began to walk again, but this time a bit faster. I heard footsteps behind me, but I was too afraid to look back. I began to jog, but with the lighting so poor, I tripped and fell. Almost immediately, I felt a hand on my shoulder and I screamed. Jamie, it's me, a familiar voice said. I looked up and there was Malik. He extended his hand and I took it. You okay? What are you doing in the park? I explained the phone call I got from Sally. Then I said, I also called your mom and she said that you went to meet your dad. Malik scratched his head. My mom and I had a huge fight. I guess she just made up that excuse because she was a little bit embarrassed. What did you guys argue about? I asked curiously. Malik and I walked through the park, keeping our eyes open for any signs of the dogs. We argued about what we always argue about. Me wanting to go back home and seeing my friends again. Here isn't that bad now, is it? I asked and stopped. He looked at me and held my hand. Actually, it isn't. My eyes lowered to the ground as I blushed. To my delight, he didn't let go of my hand and we continued to look for the dogs holding hands. After 30 minutes, I sighed heavily. I need to get home. I don't understand where they could be. I'm sure they'll show up, Malik said, squeezing my hand lightly. He walked me home and we said our goodbyes as we stopped at the front of my house. Over the next few days, Sally and Malik and I posted up pics of the missing dogs. We got closer over the next few days and began to spend more time outside of school and the animal shelter. Friday afternoon, during math class, Mr. Barnes paired the students to complete a project together. Jamie Paris, you will be paired with Malik Johnson. Malik looked at me and smiled, and I smiled back. Mr. Barnes said, This project is due on Monday. The class groaned and the bell rang. I grabbed my book and left the classroom. So I heard you got partnered with a somewhat math genius to do a math assignment, Malik said as he <laughs> fell into step next to me as I left the school building. Oh, is that right? When I get an A plus on the assignment, then I will believe the part about my partner being a math genius, Malik <laughs> laughed. Why don't you come over about 6 p.m.? My mom and dad won't be home until 8, so we would have some time to work without being disturbed. Maybe we could order some pizza. Sounds good, I said. Hey, Malik. Someone called from across the schoolyard. I'll catch up with you later, okay? I nodded and walked as he ran off in the direction of the sound of the voice. After 6 p.m., I was standing outside Malik's house and I rang the doorbell. Coming. I heard a voice on the other end say. A few seconds later, Malik opened the door. Hi there, welcome to my abode. Wow, I said as I stepped into the house and observed my surroundings. Malik's house was heavily draped and dark. It's really dark in here, I said as my eyes tried to adjust to the dark. Yeah, my mom is big on saving the whole earth thing, so we don't put on lights and stuff unless it's necessary. Don't worry, he said as his hand found mine. I'll guide you through the dark. My breath <gasps> caught in my throat as Malik maneuvered us all the way up to his bedroom. The brightness from the light of his room made me squint my eyes. I hope you like pepperoni, he said, pointing to the two pizzas and soda on my desk. Oh, crap, I said as I slipped my forehead in frustration. In my hurry to get here on time, I forgot to walk with my laptop, I said with a sheepish grin as I looked at Malik, feeling embarrassed. It's okay, he said. My laptop is up and running and ready to use. Why don't you open a Word document to get us started while I grab some cups and ice? I nodded and headed to the desk where his laptop sat. I sat behind the desk and was about to open up a Word document when a notification popped up. 
Hey Malik, where are you? We are missing the life of the party. We have some fresh meat here that's good for the taking. Sent by delicious underscore vampire 18. What the hell did I just read? I thought to myself. Fresh meat? Something caught my eye at the back of the table. It was a small silver pendant. I reached for it. Pixie. The golden retriever's name was engraved on the pendant. Another notification popped up this time in the form of a video. It showed three people tied up and two girls looking over them with their fangs out. What the hell? I stood up quickly and the chair fell. I grabbed my things and Pixie's pendant and headed down the stairs. I made it out of the house without Malik. Malik seeing me, or so I thought. Outside under the street light with his arms folded was Malik. Hey, where are you going? He asked as I reached within ear range. My mom called me and said that there was an emergency and I needed to get home right away. I said, not looking in Malik's direction. You mean on this phone? Malik asked. I looked in horror as I recognized the phone that was in his hand. It was mine. So, he said as he stood directly in my path. Are you going to continue to lie to me? I don't like liars. I looked into his eyes and they weren't hazel anymore. Red eyes glared back at me. I gulped and twitched nervously. I saw the message from delicious underscore 18. So, um, are you a vampire? I was more curious at this point than scared. I mean, we all grew up with Count Dracula stories, but we all knew that vampires were mythical beings. I am, he said with a smug smile. But how could that be? Aren't vampires allergic to sunlight? I asked. I asked more so just to fill in the awkward stretch of silence between us. Some vampires, yes, but I am a daywalker. Half vampire, half human. My dad fell in love with a vampire. She decided that she would stop drinking human blood, but she would drink animal blood instead. Pixie and Hercules, I gasped as I squeezed Pixie's pendant in my hand. I backed away fearfully. Don't be silly, Jamie. You can't run, and unlike my mother, I will suck you dry. His fangs popped out and I screamed. Then everything went black. I woke up and realized that I was tied to a chair and my mouth was gagged. I screamed and struggled against the ropes. I heard hushed, angry voices coming from the next room. I hushed and listened closely. We have no choice but to take her with us, dear. It's the only way. We can't afford to be exposed. Again. A deep male voice said, Why can't we just obey the damn rules? We have rules for a reason. If he wasn't my son, I would have taken him to the council myself. I recognized that voice as Malik's mother. Just then, the light flickered on and I watched as Malik walked into the other room. Boxes. There were a lot of boxes. Uncle Pete said he's on his way, Malik said to the people in the next room. Well, Malik, I hope you were happy with yourself. I watched as Malik's mother walked up the stairs as though I wasn't even in the room. For the next two hours, I watched as the family packed up everything they owned. There was a honk outside the house. You, Malik's dad said to him sternly. Watch her while your mother and I pack the van. Malik sat on a chair next to me to keep an eye on me. I continued to struggle against the ropes and he laughed. Soon you'll be one of us, he said. I pulled away, disgusted, and began to scream, tears streaming down my face. Once the house was empty, Malik came back with a rug. He untied me from the chair and rolled me quickly on the rug and swung me on his shoulder. I heard the front door close. We were heading towards the van. I heard the struggle, but the rug was too tight. I fell asleep in that rug that night, dreading where I would wake the next day. Beams of sunlight danced across my face. I slowly opened my eyes, wondering what fresh hell was awaiting me. My heart jerked as I realized that I was home. I was in my own room, in my own bed. I felt a wave of relief wash over my whole body. It was just a dream. None of it was real. Vampires weren't real. Pixie and Hercules were okay. I breathed a sigh of relief, and I dressed quickly and got ready for school. I couldn't wait to tell Sophia about the dream that I had. Once at school, I met Sophia by her locker. Hey, Jamie, did you see the new guy yet? Huh? What new guy? I asked, searching the faces of the hallway. There he comes. There he comes. Sophia said, excited. Excitedly, my eyes came face to face with him. He was here at my school. Malik! I told my friends about the dream that I had, and they just laughed it off. Needless to say, while my friends goggled at Malik, I kept my distance. For the next three months, he felt like nothing but a bad dream. I called Sally at the animal shelter and told her that I had too much schoolwork and I wouldn't be able to make it to the shelter. She said that was fine since they just got a new volunteer. I came to school the next day, and Sophia told me that the night before, Malik's family had mysteriously left town. Rumor has it that his father was a fugitive of the law and that's why he and his family left. At least Pixie and Hercules are still safe and sound at the animal shelter. I thought everything was fine and I was starting to move on from my bad dream when suddenly the phone rang. Hello? It was Sally. Jamie, she said frantically. What is it, Sally? Jamie, two of the dogs are missing. I felt my jaw drop. 